Then we're ready for our seven and seven. Are you ready for our seven and seven? So these are all amazing leaders in our church. We have Mornay. He's our life groups pastor. He oversees our life groups. And Mornay does a lot of other things. Tristan, Amber, you can be so proud of your dad. He's amazing. Then we have Clinton, one of our second year students. He also... He also heads up our young adults ministry. And then we have Anneli and... <laughs> Anneli oversees Hope Church Wilderness Heights. And she's employed at Hope Church George to care for our volunteers. And she's doing a great job. <laughs> Whoever thought that would be a job description? Care for the volunteers. I think it's awesome. And then we have Clay. Claire oversees anything that goes into our mouths, <laughs> as well as insurance. When we need insurance to pay out, she's the person to go to. And then we've got James. James. James is one in our worship team, one of our worship leaders. He's our youth leader. He's our creative. All the videos you see on social media, James is putting that together. A great guy. Agnesia is our kids' church pastor. <laughs> and Felicia, Felicia. So Felicia heads up Ignite. That's our grade four to grade seven kids ministry. She's also one of our second year students and they're all amazing. Can you all take a deep breath? Let it out. We family, we love you. We want to hear from you. Give it to Morna. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, it's going to be rapid fire, so you've got to keep up with me, right? So, clock is counting, and I've got some time to get through. So, this is a birthday party, and it's a year of significance, right? The number seven is a year of significance. And right through the Bible, we see this number seven appearing all the time. New Testament, Old Testament, and it actually means quite a lot. But I'm going to throw some verses at you, but we're going to participate in this because it's a birthday celebration, right? So every time I do this, you're going to shout number seven. Are you ready? One, two, three. Seven. Come on, a little louder. One, two, three. Seven. All right, here we go. Keep up. The earth was created in six days and God rested on the? Seven. Elisha told Naaman to wash in the Jordan River. Seven. Times in order to be healed. Israel marched around Jericho six days, but on the? Seven. He marched. Seven. We were commanded to work six days and on the? Seven. Day we were told to rest. Jesus says that we are for, to forgive 70 by? Seven. And the last one, Jesus mentions? Seven times, I am, I'm the vine, I'm the truth, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection. Awesome. But also, this number seven means, in the Bible, it means completeness, perfection, and achievement. So you know what? When God looks at this church, He sees completion, perfection, and achievement. Awesome. But it also means one more thing. And this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. It means significance. You know, seven years ago, seven years ago, God planted a dream in a young couple's heart. They were seven, well, hold on, hold on. They were seven years younger. Marinette, you still look as awesome as ever. Paul, are you okay there? Cool. But God planted a dream in their heart, and this was the dream. That the church will be planted and it will be a church of significance. That it will be a light upon a hill that many will flock to. That people will come in here, they will find healing, they will be set free, and they will come to know God. A church of significance. It was a dream. And in the very first service, me and my family, we, we, we sat in the very first service of this church. Paul preached a message. And we sat there and we thought to ourselves, God, what can you do with this? God, it was humble beginnings, but God, what can you do with this? And you know what? We look back at the last seven years, and this is nothing short of a miracle. Nothing short. But how many of you know that miracles take work? Come on. 
Miracles take work. Often at times we think that a miracle is going to fall from heaven into our laps. And you know what? God works like that sometimes. But the more I read my Bible, the more I search through it, the more I, I, I dig a little deeper, I'm coming to discover miracles take work. You see, because miracles require faith. Miracles require prayer. Miracles require us to be faithful to the little things that God puts in our hands. You know what? We started off little. And we might be a young church, but we're a church of significance. <laughs> Often we get visiting pastors, world leaders in church. They travel the world, and they've got a bird's eye view of what church should be like. And every time they come here, you know what? It's the same voice that goes out, and this is the voice. It says, what's happening over here is something of significance. What's happening over here is not normal. This is not normal. And we should never treat it as normal because it's a miracle in the making. God is busy doing something of significance in our community. And you know what? Seven years ago, we started off with 60 people. 60. I stood in the auditorium today and I said, God, I remember seven years ago I asked, what can you do? And you showed us. <laughs> but you know what? Seven years ago, another voice went out and it was an ungodly voice. And this is what the voice said. When the dream was about to be birthed of a church, this voice said this. What of significance can come out of George? <laughs> Natasha and I, we're parents to our kids, and often at times we need to reprimand our kids. And it starts off like this. I'm doing something in the house. Natasha's talking to the kids. All of a sudden, I hear a heated debate. One of the kids says something that's dishonoring to their mom. You know what? As a dad, I jump off that couch. I move over, and I do my famous Bill Cosby saying, we brought you into this world. <laughs> and we will take you out of this world. <laughs> this is how I thought about that saying over the years. God must have been in his throne room. He heard that voice go out. It was an ungodly voice that said, what of significance can come out of a small town of George? God must have sat upon his throne. He bolted himself forward. He said, Did I hear correctly? He must have shouted for the archangel Michael to come into his chambers, and he said, yo, Michael, did you hear what they just said? Michael never said a word, but he had a smirk on his face because he knew what was coming. And God said to him, now we're going to show them what we're going to do. <laughs> so this is what happened over seven years, seven years. And to God be the glory. In seven years, God's moved us from humble premises into a building that looks awesome, but is fast becoming too small. In seven years, God has moved us from 60 people to over 2,000 on a Sunday. He's moved us. He's moved us from 30, 40 kids to, over, to almost 400 kids on a Sunday. He's moved us from a handful of volunteers that did everything to an army of red shirts that every Sunday lay down their lives for the sake of others. God has given us a footprint, but it's a global footprint. This is the head office of the Zambia Project. It's the head office of Hope Art. It's the head office of Ark Southern Africa. Hold on, brother. <laughs> it's the offices of Ark Southern Africa, and here it is. Here it is. Next month, there's world leaders, significant leaders, over 400 of them from around the world coming to little old George, to a church of significance. And they're coming. They're coming. They're coming because they want to be inspired. They want to be impacted. And they want to go plant churches of significance in their little old towns. So come on. I've got a few seconds. Stand to your feet. We're going to give praise to God for everything that He's done over the last seven years. But also we're going to give praise to a couple that dare to believe that God can plant something of significance. A church of significance. In little... Whoa. <laughs> All right, you guys can sit down. He had his moment. <laughs> that was some fire. Give him another round of applause, guys. Right, stop it, stop. Taking my time away. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, as you guys heard, my name from Marinette, and you guys said I'm a second year student, but I'd love to give some more info about myself. Um, I was born and raised in George's. And I'm still in George, which means George must be an amazing city, right? Anyone believe that with me today? And some more info about myself. I love music, for those who don't know. I play the drums. I love playing the keyboard a bit. 
I love singing. I love rapping as well. Made of fake. William, can you come on the drums? And give me a beat quickly. I think it's about time I told these guys how it's done. Let's give them a round of applause, guys. All right. All right, you ready? No praise, buddy. Let's go. Hey. Okay. Okay, you ready? And then in step Jesus. All men were created to lead, but we needed somebody to lead us more than a teacher. But somebody to buy us back from the darkness. You can say he redeemed us. Thought us that real leaders follow God. Finish the work, because we own our jobs. Thought us not to rob. But give life, love a wife like he loved the church. Without seeing how many hearts we can break first. I want to be like you in every way. So if I got to die every day, unworthy sacrifice. But the least I can do is give the most of me. Because being just like you is what I'm supposed to be. They say you came for the lame. I'm the lamest. I made a mess, but you say you'll erase it. I'll take it. They say you came for the lame. I'm the lamest. I broke my life, but you say you replace it. I'll take it. Thank you, William. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you can say that. You can say that. I might use you again later on. <laughs> All right, guys, I have a few minutes left. I have five minutes left. And so I would love to talk to you guys about loving people, right? And so since a young age, I had a love for people. Like I was the one in my friend circle who would sacrifice literally anything for my friends. And I probably, I don't know if I'm still that person. My friends, where you guys said, I don't know. I used to, <laughs> they're laughing. That's a good thing. All right, so. <laughs> and I used to be like the generous, the generous person in the group. Everyone's stingy, but I come, you know what? Even though I might need the money more than them because I love chips and I want to buy myself chips, I know you guys are that person, but I'll give the money to them anyways. Why? Because they, at the moment, more important than me, for me. Sometimes we've got to be less. But, and it's not because... Ah, Clinton, you're a good boy. No, but because I believe God called every single person to be a person in love, right? To be a person that loves those around us, no matter, no matter what. And so we're going to read out of 1 John 4 from verse 7 to verse 11. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And I'm going to I'm going to stop there. So what the scripture is telling us clearly that God is the essence of love, right? Love is in the very nature of God. That's who God is. That's what God does. That's how God rolls. That's how God do his thing. That's it. Like that's full stop. That's who God is, right? And so in order for us to know what love is, we got to get to know who love is. We want to get to know how to do this thing called love. We got to get to know God. And how do we do that? We step into his presence every single day, reading his word, praying to God, opening up our heart, allowing him to speak into us and to speak over us because he's love. Love is not a feeling, guys. Don't like this. Love is a person. And that's God. And then from verse 9 to 11, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God, loves in us, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And so if we look at it clearly, what the word is telling us is that Sacrifice is the foundation of love. God was willing to sacrifice his son Jesus. Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life. Question is, what are we willing to sacrifice to the people around us? I don't know. It, it could be that maybe you, someone hurt you really bad and you feel nothing but hatred toward that person. Or maybe it's time to take a step of love and sacrifice that feeling of yours and forgive people because that's a step of love God wants us to take. Because we don't forgive, forget, forgive people, God won't forgive us. Or maybe you need to sacrifice some time for a friend or for a family member who really needs to spend time with you. Maybe you need to encourage a friend or family member. Or maybe you have to sacrifice some of your belongings. Maybe you to sacrifice some of your belongings to someone who needs it more than you do. Almost getting lost. <laughs> See, here's what I believe. That we need to be people who love people so much that people think we're crazy. Like what I'm saying is, we need to be the kind of person who are like, listen, I don't care who you are, I love you. I don't care where you come from, 
I love you. I don't care what you do to me. I love you. I don't care if you hate me, whether you don't like me. I love you. I don't care if you get tired of me loving you. I'm going to keep on loving you because that's the calling God gave me. Right? Because the truth is, the truth is, we're not supposed to love people because of who they are, because of what they have, because of what they do or where they come from. We're supposed to love people because God loved us first. Amen? I have a minute left. I have a minute left. So if, if there's one thing I want you guys to walk away with is don't love people because of what they do. Love them in spite of what they do. In short, love people anyways. No matter what, no matter where, no matter if you're not going to benefit out of it, just love them because God called you to love people. He said this word, as I loved you, so you must love one another. And how did he love us? By sacrificing for us. And so we need to sacrifice for people. I have 30 seconds. William, can you play that beat again? Okay. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to say, God loved me first, inspired me, so I love you. Uh, so you guys are going to say, I love you, I love you. God loved me first, inspired me, so God loved me first, inspired of me, so Go. God love me first, in spite of me. So, one more time. God love me first, in spite of me. So, well done. God loved us first. Six years ago, I was standing in my classroom and I was speaking to God, and I said, God, there's got to be more. More time to do what really matters. A short six months later, Paul and Marinette called me and they asked me to head up the wilderness church plant. I knew they had it wrong. Me? How could God use me? I was an abused child, divorced twice, a single mom of two children. I didn't study theology and I knew nothing about church planting. There was no ways God could use me. But I promised them that I would pray, and I did. And God gave me Isaiah 43, verse 10. And it says, you are my hand-picked servant. Amen. That's when I knew that Paul and Marinette's got a direct line to heaven. <laughs> I learned that God's love was enough. To help me through everything in wilderness, everywhere that I had to serve, his God, his love was enough. And I also realized that our past doesn't define us. If our lives are um, submitted to Christ, there is nothing that can stop us because Jesus qualifies us. Um. One way of valuing volunteers is to know their names. And I'm, I'm really very good at knowing names. And I was determined to learn as many names as fast as possible. So in Discovery, I meet all these amazing people. And I meet this lovely young man called Sean. And the first week, Sean comes, and he's so polite, and he chats. And I thought, wow, what a cool guy. The next week, Sean comes, and I see, but Sean also serves at seating. And I thought, wow. The third week, Sean comes to Discovery, and I saw that afterwards, he also served at the videography. Man, and I was impressed with this young man. We need guys like this in our church. So I introduced Sean to numerous people. And I chatted with Sean whenever I saw him and encouraged him. But it was only in week four that I discovered that Sean's real name is actually Josh. <laughs> For three weeks, this young man was gracious enough to allow me to call him Sean. And his love was enough to cover my mistake. Paul um, taught us from Luke 10 a while ago, and he taught us about the Good Samaritan. And he shared how the Samaritan had pity on the injured man, how he knelt down to nurse his wounds, how he picked him up off the road, and he put him on his donkey, 
and he took him to the inn. And now he asked the people, he paid them to care for this man until he returned. On Thursday at Life Group, we were chatting, and Um Sarl said to me, he said, Anneli, do you realize that this is the image of Jesus? This is what Jesus does for us. He meets us at our point of hurt. He binds up our wounds. He rescues us off the road that we are on. And he brings us to the inn, the church, to you guys, to be healed, to be made whole, to be loved. I was once called to um, the deathbed of a friend. Um, they asked me to come and pray for him. He was dying. And as I stood there next to his bed, God said to me, sing in Afrikaans. <laughs> and I was like, Lord, if this is really you and you're serious, you, you've got to tell me what to sing. And he did. And I was standing there with my brother-in-law next to this dying man's bed, and, and I started to hum, and there was like silence in the room. And my brother-in-law looked seriously uncomfortable, and then I started to sing, and he looked nervous. <laughs> and, and as I was singing, this man's breathing calmed down, and he slowly, quietly passed away. But now, whenever I offer to pray for anybody, my brother-in-law says, don't let her sing to you. <laughs> she sings people to death. <laughs> but I'm telling you that God's love was enough even to use my singing. What, don't believe what my brother-in-law tells you. I've learned that in my most embarrassing moments, God's love is enough. He was enough to use me in my brokenness. His love is enough to use my singing to bring comfort to a dying man. His love is enough to let Josh forgive me for calling him Sean for a month. His love is enough to help you take your next step. His love is enough to help you forgive the people that have hurt you. His love is enough to help you love those people who don't love you back. Now, I want to say to you, his love is enough to help you serve and make a difference. Can I ask everybody who wears a red T-shirt on a Sunday to stand? Everybody who wears a red T-shirt on a Sunday, please stand. I want to say to you that not all superheroes wear capes. I believe that in Hope Church... The superheroes wear red welcome home t-shirts. Good evening, everybody. No notes. Oops. I'm believing God is just going to help me with this. So um, we're not winging it. We're just um, going to go there. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my life story because I think most of you only realize that I'm here at church and I work at church. Um, I started off on the 25th of December 2012. I felt I needed to go to church. So our family went off to church, Hope Church, four months after Paul and Marinette were here. And um, my children got in the car and were on our way and they said, can we please come back? And I looked, and my husband said, yes. And I was like, what? Because um, our association with the Happy Clappy Church at that stage was they just wanted money. That was all we could get out of it. How wrong were we? And God enjoyed showing us. Needless to say, Paul and Marinette befriended us loved on us, and um, my husband, being a golfer at the time, invited them to the Meshi course just down the road to play with our families a round of golf. 
Anyway, we were about two holes in Marinette and I lost total interest in the whole lot because, yeah, you can imagine. Got totally engrossed in conversation and she was telling me how we need to start an evening service, which they did, and um, how they would like to start a kids' service with that so that the parents could attend and the kids the same as the morning. But she didn't have anybody at the time because Agnisha had just had little Levi and he was still tiny. So, <laughs> not thinking she'd say yes, I said, oh, how many kids are there? So she says, oh, about six or seven, obviously with the intention of growing because that's what the intention was. So I thought, well, we could maybe handle this. But she probably won't because I don't know anything about God or anything else. So I said, I can do it for you if you like. <laughs> to which she politely says, yes, are you sure? And suddenly, from nowhere, I mean nowhere, this voice says, yes, of course. And to my horror, it was mine. Anyway, now I'm sitting. How do I do this? Well, I love two things. Children and food. <laughs> and um, I thought, well, let's just put the two together. So I said to Marinette, well, let's make this easy for people. If we offer them a meal, then they just have to bath the kids before they come. We feed them and then they go home to bed. So why wouldn't they want to come to evening church? Anyway, I said, no, don't. She's like, no, but we don't have a but I said, don't worry, I'll do it. Not that we had the finances, but anyway. Um, so I thought, well, we don't have the finances, so let's just throw hot dogs out there. <laughs> so we started off with hot dogs and um, a few kids. And I thought, oh, shame, dessert. <laughs> Couple of donuts. They were reasonably cheap at the time. And then... As we went on, if the children remembered their verse, so we gave them a fizzer to say, well done. Do you see where this is going? <laughs> when the kids finally got home, shook it up, <laughs> the last thing that was happening was they were going to sleep. <laughs> but they all really enjoyed kids' church, and we grew. <laughs> Who knew? Even me and my walk, I learned those kids' Bible stories well. And that's how my walk started. That was my introduction to serving. And that was all thanks to God, Paul, and Marinette loving on me. And through that love, I felt valued. Through value, it gave me purpose. So I just want you all to know here, that you're loved, you're valued, and your purpose is in this church with God. I'd like to share a verse with you. It's from Matthew 20, 26 to 28. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. So, Hope Church is not asking you to serve. God is asking you to serve people in his church. That's all. If you don't know what to do, if you don't know how to do it, ask anybody with a red t-shirt. They will help you. They're dying to love on you and to let you call this place home because each and every one of you belong here. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. So get involved and serve. You don't need to be good at anything. <laughs> yes, um, well... If God and Paula Marini could take a chance on me, we can take a chance on you. Broken, repaired, happy, sad, 
We want you all the way you are. So please, please come and serve. Awesome. Okay. Ooh. Yo. I just have to get something out of the way. I'm really prepared. Do you, is that convinced? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so before we get into it, um, hello. Um, I just want to give a shout out to some people. Family, my mum and dad, Carl and William. Thank you, you're my family, well done. My other family, my other family. The second year students and the first year students, where are you guys at? Okay, that's like the first level to being cool is become a student, just so you know. And finally, uh, we all owe thanks to these two people and we've all been saying it. Paula Marinette, you are the greatest leaders in the world. Uh, so we want to honor you and thank you for everything. Really, well done, there we go, come on. Okay, 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 hold on, hold on, hold, sit down, sit down, sit, shh. Okay, cool, well done, I feel like a teacher. Okay, so we're here to celebrate 10 years, seven years, seven years, oh, okay. You guys are awake, you guys are awake, that's good. So we're here to celebrate seven years. Um, your time's up. Um, and we're going to talk about winning. Because I really believe we all want to win. And I 100% believe that this church is winning. Amen? Okay, cool. So if you want to stand up, you can stand up. If you want to clap, you can clap. If you want to dance, like Mornay. Eh? <laughs> Go for it, it's fine. We're going to have a party. Um, so we're going to talk about winning. And Jesus is like the ultimate winner. So obviously you're going to start with Jesus. Uh, John 16, verse 33, says this. Awesome. There we go. <laughs> but take heart, I have overcome the world. And this is like everything. The world contains everything. You're in it. Your family's in it. Your house is in it. Your possessions are in it. Your car, everything. Everything is in the world. And this, this blew my mind when I read this next part. The next verse, John 17 verse 1, says this. After this, after Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. And this hour he's talking about is the hour where he's going to be killed, he's going to be whipped, he's going to be stabbed, he's going to be mocked, he's going to be dragged, he's going to be carrying a cross to where he's going to die. And yet, what blows my mind is the verse before, Jesus says, I have overcome. Just think about that. Before he even goes to die, before he sacrificed himself for you and me, he has overcome. And what this taught me is that we don't have to fight for victory, we fight from victory. We fight from victory. Amen. So if Jesus, if Jesus can do that, so can we. He was the victory before he even was killed. And that's the same for us. We don't have to fight for it or strive for it. This is where we start. We start with victory. And I want to show you guys something quickly. Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Um, so what happens was, I'm going to move this table back. On the first day, Joshua and Israelites and the army walk around one time. Second day, another time. That's two. Three. Oh, my word. This is a bad idea. Four. Five. Six. Whoa. Seven. There we go. Seven. Woo. And on the seventh day, on the seventh day, give me a second, man. Wow. On the seventh day, they walked around the walls seven times. On, on the last step, the last guy walked around, the last footstep, every single wall, every brick came falling down, and the guys charged in. Uh, and it's so easy to miss this. Uh, I did for, for a long time. It's so easy to, it's, it's, ugh, your English, where'd it go? There you go. Okay, got it. Um, it's so easy to miss that they walked around the wall, and the walls, the walls fell down. And I think a lot of us say, oh, the victory came then, right? Because that's when the walls came down, they went in, the king was theirs, the people were theirs, the possessions were theirs. But actually, no. Joshua 6, verse 2. This is what God says. Before they even set foot around the wall, the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have handed Jericho over to you, along with its king and its soldiers. Because God knows that when we start with a promise and we start with victory, all we got to do is do the work. That's all we have to do. And a little bit about my story is so my family's from the UK, except for my mum. She's the outlier. She's very different. Mum, where are you at? Hello, hello. Um, please don't cry. Um, <laughs> she always cries. Is she crying? No. So 
I'm from England, uh, and when we moved here almost six years ago, wow, um, it, was, it sucked, honestly. Like, I love you guys. I love it now. Don't worry. It's cool. But literally in a day, the world flipped, and I had no friends, nothing. I just had my family. And, and then when I started coming to church, uh, and I joined the worship team, and Dion came, and I was still shy. I didn't like being on stage. I didn't like talking to people. didn't like making friends. Um, and then God, not God, what's his name? Dion. Dion put uh, an image in my mind. He said, James, I'm, gonna, I'm calling you out. You're, you're made for more. You're going to do this. One day you're going to lead worship. One day you're going to speak. And I'm sat there, and I'm like, me, whoa, slow down, bro. Come on. I, I, did, I didn't even like talking in front of like two people. And God and Dion put this image in my head, and I had to see my victory in the future, just like Joshua did before he walked around the walls. The Lord said to Joshua, see, victory is about a mindset. You've got to change what you're looking at in order to get there. <laughs> Amen? And now, like, I, I love all of you, but I don't know all of you, but this is not just my truth, it's not just Jesus' truth, and it's not just Joshua's, it's for you. Wherever you're standing or sitting, your family, victory starts with Jesus. Your friends, victory starts with Jesus. Your workplace, victory starts with Jesus. Your school, victory starts with Jesus. The people you know across the world, victory starts with Jesus. Nothing could ever stop it. Nothing. So we're going to say this together. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Let's together. We don't fight for victory. We don't fight from victory. Okay, one more time. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Amen? Amen. Awesome. I just love this amazing team. You guys are amazing. I know. Joking. Okay, cool. So I want to start with a joke. I really hope you guys are going to laugh. <laughs> Let's just laugh. So what did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. <laughs> okay, one more. Why did Noah never go fishing? Because he only had two worms. Okay, what's up? <laughs> so this... This past month and a bit at Kids Church. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to start telling more jokes. So this past month and a bit at Kids Church, we've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And I just love the topic. I think it's such an important topic. And we ended off with self-control last week. And we spoke a little bit out of James, and I want to share on that tonight. Um, James is amazing, but please go read it. We don't have time tonight to read all of it, so I'm just going to read a little bit. And I have James 3, verse 5. And so, the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries, carries great power. Just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze. And the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum total of wickedness, and it's the most dangerous part of a human body. It corrupts the entire body and its hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. Down to verse 10. Out of the same mouth, we pour out words of praise one minute and curse the next. My brothers and sisters, this should never be. Wow, what a verse. What a scripture. My boys love playing superhero games, and they now and again will say, Mom, Mom, what can my superpowers be? And I'll tell them, you know what? I have a secret. You have superpowers. And I'll tell them, your words have power. You can break people down, or you can build people up. So we, I don't know if you've ever seen this illustration of toothpaste. Our words are like toothpaste. It's so easy just to talk, right? Sometimes we talk without even talking. And things will come out of our mouth like, um, I'll never be good enough. I'll never get healed. My husband will never change. My child will never be good in maths. Or gossiping like, oh, did you see that what that person was wearing in church today? 
There's no hope for South Africa. And that's words we just easily say. But have you ever tried to put toothpaste back into the tube? It's very difficult, right? And that's how it's with our words. It's so easy to talk, but to take it back is not that easy. Toothpaste has two purposes. One, it's for ourselves, right? Anyone has ever tried to brush teeth without toothpaste? I've had to do it once or twice when we run out of toothpaste. But it's not the same. It doesn't feel good. You don't feel fresh. It's just not the same. And toothpaste is like the Word of God as well. We need to brush our teeth every morning. We need to spend time with God every morning, and He'll give us the words to speak. And then we will speak life over our situations and not death. We'll say things like, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My husband is fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to spend time. It is, by the way. <laughs> we need to spend time with God in the mornings, like we need to brush our teeth in the mornings. The second purpose of toothpaste is for other people around us. I don't like, I um, agree, you, you will agree as well. I don't like being around people that has not brushed their teeth. And it's the same, I don't like being around people that are negative, that complains all the time, that sees everything negative. At Kids Church, we have the most amazing team. I love, I love our volunteers. We really are the best team. Yes. <laughs> and there's one particular volunteer, I just love being around them. When I go to her and say, hey, how are you doing? She will, without skipping a bit, she's like, oh, I'm doing so well. And she's got so, so much joy in her. And you know what? I know her life is not easy. But she chooses to speak life over situations. She believes and she trusts that the best is yet to come. And I believe when people walk through these doors on a Sunday, they need to feel encouraged, like this girl make me feel encouraged. They need to feel encouraged, they need to be full of joy, they need to be, feel the love of Jesus when they walk into this place. Proverbs 12 verse 25 says, a word of encouragement does wonders. And tonight, I want us to start declaring over our lives. Maybe I struggle with it all the time to be positive and speak life over my life and over people around me. But I'm going to try every day. And today, I want us all to try from today to declare God's goodness over our lives. So everyone, please stand. I'm gonna, you can just repeat it after me, but repeat it like you mean it. I'm healthy. I'm, healthy. I'm strong. I'm good looking. I'm, good looking. I'm, gifted. I'm gifted. I'm talented. I'm talented. I, am I am valuable. I have a purpose. I, a purpose. I, am I am confident. People like me. People like I, am I am blessed. You can sit for a moment for 30 seconds. So we need to decide in life. What is our toothpaste going to look like? Because as soon as it's out, we can't take it back. We need to decide to use our words for good and not for evil. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. How amazing this. That was amazing. Guys, that's my boss. It's good off for Agnesha. Good, 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 good. Awesome. Are you guys still awake? Uh, are you guys still awake? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Awesome. So what we're going to do, since I'm the last person, we are going to pray for seven minutes. So everyone can close your eyes. I'm just going to close off for us. I don't know why you guys are laughing. Can we, can we close our eyes? <laughs> can we close our eyes? Are we closing our eyes? Okay, I'm just joking. And we're not going to pray. <laughs> we're not going to pray. So what we're going to be doing tonight is so we're going to be looking at the church and the body of church and all the different parts and how every part is important. No part is more important than any other part. Being on stage is not the best place where you're going to reach people. You smiling at welcome desk or making coffee for someone, that could also still reach a person. And it just reminds me, 
of a story of when I was in high school. I'm not going to tell you when or how many years. So that's going to give away my age. And I don't think it's good for you guys to know. It's a secret. I'm still dealing with it. So, <laughs> so um, we were great. I was in grade 10. And a, a, a group of uh, my friends and I decided, hey, we can sing. So why don't we start a singing group? So we're like, okay, yeah, let's do that. But like, because we're the cool people, we're not just going to have a singing group. It's going to be an a cappella group. So if you don't know what an a cappella is, it's like you don't have instruments. You just, your voices are the instruments. So I was like, woo, come on. I've always seen this on the TV. I was like, it looks so cool. I'm going to be part of one. It's going to be great. So I'm like, okay, so guys, so what's everyone going to do? Who's going to be the soloist? I mean, I don't mind doing it. But then they're like, hey, Felicia, what you will do is you're going to be the shubab girl. So I was the one that was doing shubab, shubidu. So I was the one, I was basically the instrument. That's who I was in the group. So I did the humming, I did the shubabing, I did like everything. And then it gets to like halfway through grade 10, I'm like, okay, Maybe they're just like testing to see how I am. And then by like grade 11, I will be a soloist. I'll start singing solos. So it gets to grade 11. I'm like, oh, first day of school. Let's do this. I'm going to be the soloist in my group. Come on. I get there to practice. So what's happening? No, Felicia, you stole the instrument. Oh. I'm like, guys, come on. Like, when am I going to get to sing? When am I going to share my voice like Soraya does on a Sunday? I was like, oh. So then I get there. And we now halfway through grade 11, I'm like, okay, matric, that's the year. That's where everything happens. We have our matric dance. That's just the best year for everything to happen. So I'm like, okay, matric is going to be the year. I'm going to be that soloist. We get to matric. I get to my friends. I'm like, hey, guys, come on. What are we doing? We're about to perform. They're like, no, Felicia, you're still the instrument. I mean, you're still the instrument. I'm like, oh, guys. So for the whole time, all those two years, the whole time I was the shuba, shubi do. Are you guys going to join me? Everyone do this. Shuba, shubi do, shuba, shubi. I'm going to sing in the still of joy. <laughs> that was my moment to shine. Yes, I had it. <laughs> I had my moment to shine. But what I didn't notice is without my shuba, shubaping, the group wouldn't have been a cappella. If we were all soloists, then it wouldn't have sounded like an a cappella group if we were all singing the same voice. So I was like, wow, actually, I actually do play a part, even though I'm like the person playing a triangle in the corner. Hey, I'm still part of the group. And that's just amazing about church as well. That's the thing about church. It doesn't matter where you're serving. Kids Church is the best place though. But it doesn't, matter where, it doesn't matter where you're serving, you make a difference. Whether it's a welcome desk, making coffee, everything is needed. I have a verse, kitchen. Kitchen as well. That's the best place, because that's where food is. Come on. Woo -woo. Okay, and the verse is from Ephesians 4 verse 16, and it says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I love how it says every, every part has its special work. So every one of us have something that you can give to the church. And we want to encourage you. Auntie Anneli is the person that deals with all our volunteers. If you don't know where you want to serve, you can come and speak to her. and She'll get you a place to serve, hopefully Kids Church. But... It's that that's the important thing. You might be sitting there and you're like, oh, but I can't do this, so I can't do that. All of us are part of that verse. We all have that special thing that God's given us that we can give to the church. So can you turn to the person next to you and say, your shubap is very important. Okay. Your shubab is very important. Can we all say that at the same time? One, two, three. Your shubab is very important. Your shubab is very important. If you feel like you're just a shubab, shubab like me in the background, you are needed because the church is not going to feel complete without you. You have something that the church needs, and we want you to bring that to us. So speak to Auntie Anneli, get joined in. 
It is amazing. Join the party. Seven years we've been going. Seven years. It's going to be good. So one more time, what do we need to say about you up? Oh, yes. One more time. Your Shabbat. Okay, last thing. Can I end off with this? You are you for a reason. So be the best you. Do that by joining the team. Woo! Awesome.